Hey yo, so by now some of you have probably seen the music video for This Is America by Childish Gambino, aka actor and comedian Donald Glover. Some people have called it a work of creative genius, subversive, and the best social commentary they've ever seen. I I'd call it maybe the most crucial piece of mainstream art that we've seen in some time, and I'll get into the reasons why I think that later. But first, let me summarize what you see in this video for those who haven't seen it. This is also linked in the show notes if you want to watch along, perhaps. So the video starts with a, a title screen, and after a few seconds, cuts to the interior of a, an expansive warehouse where we see a guitar sitting upright on a chair. And if you look at the support beams to the right of the chair, you'll see Glover standing behind them with his back turned. It's kind of subtle, but you're definitely meant to see him back there, and this tips us off right away that we need to pay attention to what's happening in the background and that what's happening in the background is just as important, and as we actually move through the video, more important than what's happening in the foreground. It's a nice setup scene here in the beginning, and by the end of the video, we'll see why. So a black man then enters from the right of the frame and sits in the chair and starts playing the guitar to the beat of the music. I saw some people online say this was actually Trayvon Martin's dad. I'm sure you guys remember Trayvon's story from a few years ago. I saw others refute that, though, and I'm not really sure who that is, to be honest. And the camera this whole time has been moving towards Glover, and now we're focused on him, shirtless, back to the camera, hands straight down to his sides, kind of jerks his head to the beat, and then slowly turns and starts dancing to the music. And the dancing... Uh, in this video is what some have called a, a Jim Crow style caricature and it's obviously meant to you know sort of mock the viral dances that you see across social media and YouTube and that mocking tone is important to keep in mind uh, because the lyrics and the dancing in the video to me strike as sort of a, a a big fuck you to American culture and I guess maybe the modern music scene. So Glover dances up behind the man in the chair who no longer has the guitar and instead has like some white hood covering his entire head and Glover here reaches into the back of his pants and pulls out a gun and he strikes a very specific pose here and let's actually just look at this pose for a minute. A lot of people have pointed out that this is the same pose made famous by Thomas Dartmouth Rice, a white minstrel performer who used blackface to perform a song and dance called Jump Jim Crow back in 1828. So some interesting symbolism there. Uh, let's get back to the video, and, and we'll see now Glover shoot the guy in the back of the head, and we'll notice a shift in the music from light and soft to a bit edgier and grittier. I, I saw somebody on Reddit say that it shifts from, like, The Lion King into, like, a really hardcore NWA song or something like that. Uh, so a kid runs in, and Glover actually hands him the gun, and the kid handles it with what looks like a, a satin or a silk cloth, while two other kids run in and drag the victim's body off rather unceremoniously so the message here is the gun is handled more delicately than the body of a, a dead black man then we have more of the mock dancing and we have a few black kids uh, maybe teenagers dressed in school uniforms come in behind glover and start doing the same dance that he's doing and this seems to hint that they're essentially just following the moves of an idol of a celebrity and, and mimicking them now, as this is going on in the background, we have essentially the equivalent of riots happening. People being chased, cars being looted and vandalized, more kids dancing in the background, and some money floating in the air all around them. And then we shift the scene to a group of a, a black church choir, uh, ten people singing and dancing to the music. Glover comes in to the screen through a, a door behind them and sings and dances along with them for a moment up to the foreground of the scene and then stops and he looks quite disenchanted by it all now and then he's tossed an automatic weapon from off screen and turns and shoots all the choir members. Again, hands the gun to a kid who handles it with the same style cloth we saw earlier and then Glover leaves the scene, uh, walks past the police car and rioters and continues to dance into the next scene where he continues to do this caricature dance Dancing, this mock dancing as the group of kids return to mimic the dance behind him while the riot scene intensifies behind them including a guy getting thrown off an upper level of this warehouse down onto a car and then we pan up to see a group of kids of black kids filming the entire scene on their phones and their mouths are all covered with what looks like some sort of white cloth or bandana or maybe something like those masks you wear to block air pollution inhalation and now we have another mock dance, and now there's a car on fire in the background, and let's pause it. You'll notice that at this point there's a horse and a rider in the background. This is 
obviously thought to be a reference to Revelations 6, 8. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and Hell followed with him. Uh, one commenter noted that maybe Glover is saying that we're so distracted getting money that we miss the ushering in of our own destruction in the process. So, back to the video, we have a close-up now of the dancing, and then Glover sort of pulls a mock gun pose, and everyone scatters in fear, and the music stops, and he lights up a joint and then walks off screen and cue the music back in, and we see the black man with the white hood playing the guitar in the chair. Glover climbs up on one of the cars and does some more dancing, and we pull out on the scene kind of quickly to see a bunch of the looted cars and singer SZA making a cameo sitting on one of the cars. And then we switch to the final scene here, uh, which is Glover running in the dark, and then we see he's actually being chased by a group of what looks like white people, and then the video ends. Some people have said he's running because of the joint that he had lit earlier, maybe showing how we're more concerned with persecuting people for minor drug offenses as opposed to, you know, say, the police officers who kill innocent people and seem to be rarely punished for it. Another interpretation that I thought was interesting from commenter Abiola Oki, who is black, and I don't know how to pronounce his name, so I'm sorry, but he wrote this about it. Finally, we see a terrified Gambino being chased by zombies of white people in what I understood to be a metaphor for the pervasiveness of white supremacy in black life. White supremacy seems to be the zombie that just won't die, trapping us like a caged dog, as Young Thug sings the outro, You just a black man in this world. I kenneled him in the backyard. That probably ain't life for a dog, for a big dog. And speaking of those lyrics, we should also look at the lyrics real quick. They're just as tongue-in-cheek and, and satirical as the dancing. Some of the lyrics are, uh, we just want a party, we just want the money, look at how I'm living now, police be tripping now, yeah, this is America, guns in my area, I got the strap, I gotta carry them, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna go get the bag, or I'm gonna go get the pad, Grandma told me to get the money, black man, and here's my favorite lyric later in the song. Look how I'm geeking out. I'm so fitted. I'm on Gucci. I'm so pretty. And then skipping uh, to the very end, the outro. You just a black man in this world. You just a barcode. You just a black man in this world driving expensive foreigns. You just a big dog. I count him in the backyard. So you can see these lyrics speak to a few things. First, the materialism that's run rampant in this country, as well as some other issues like police brutality, social media consumption, and what people here are really paying attention to. And I guess both the lyrics in the video uh, speak to those themes. You know, are we seeing what's happening in the background, or are we just focused on the catchy song and dance distractions thrown at us 24-7? We seem uh, too consumed with American capitalism to really give a shit about what's going on in the background. Now, a couple other things about the video. First, why was he shirtless in this? I saw one person say it was a reference to the idiom losing your shirt, which indicates losing all of your possessions and is a direct commentary on black America losing all their possessions but still dancing to the music they're creating. That's another materialistic message, and I, I don't think having less and dancing to your music is bad. It's just that the music mostly sucks. Uh, one of the dances in the video was apparently also called the Guara Guara and was a South African dance that Rihanna did at the Grammys earlier this year, so for what that's worth. On some level, though, this video and its message are pretty ironic. It's ironic that a rich black entertainer is the one delivering this commentary. I mean, I don't think Donald Glover knows the struggles of real modern America. You know, he actually uh, hosted Saturday Night Live the night before this video was released. By the way, it's odd that the video was released on a Sunday. That's pretty rare, but you can see why that happened, you know, holding it until after his Saturday Night Live gig where he also performed this song. I bring this up too because in his opening monologue there, he referenced being poor and living in New York years ago, but now he lives in LA and it's great to come back to New York because he's rich now and it's more enjoyable. So, hey, you know, that's great, man. Good for you. Kind of contradicts the point of your message in the music, though. I get that it's a sketch comedy show, but still... You're not really joking about your status. Now, when I first watched the video on Sunday afternoon, it already had about one and a half million views uh, in just about, I think it was online for about eight or so hours when I saw it. The next time I pulled it up a couple hours later, it had six million. And on Monday morning, and it had more than 20 million views. It was also being shared all over Twitter and, and Reddit and Facebook. And all things considered, this is what anyone would call a trending video. But... I noticed some people commenting both in the video comments on YouTube and on social media that it wasn't trending on YouTube in America, but it was in other countries, including places like Korea and China. 
So I went back to YouTube again and clicked the trending section in the top left of the web page. The top 10 video titles, check this out, and the channels they came from at this time, and this is this was on Sunday, about 2.15 p.m. These were the trending videos then. Number one, David Blaine and the Ice Pick Trick from The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. Number two, $8 Toast versus $20 Toast. Is it worth it? From, Bu- <laughs> from BuzzFeed Video. Number three, Carrie Underwood's music video for her song Cry Pretty. Number four, Rainbow Paint on a Speaker from the Slow Mo Guys. Number five, The Full Race of the Kentucky Derby from NBC Sports. Number six, DIY 16-pound sushi donut eating challenge from Healthy Junk Food. And healthy is spelled (laughs) H-E-L-L-T-H-Y. Number seven, Nicki Minaj's music video for her song Chun-Li. I'm sure that's pretty awful. Number eight, Stephen A. Smith commentary on LeBron James' performance over the weekend from ESPN. Number nine, the true all-screen smartphone is here from Unbox Therapy. <laughs> and number ten, the proposal of Felix and Marzia from Marzia, whoever the fuck that is. Now, with the exception of the Nicki Minaj video, all of those other videos combined, all nine of them, did not equal the view total for the Childish Gambino video. In fact. It didn't even add up to half of what his total was. I think he had he had 16 million when I did this, and all those other videos didn't even add up to eight. They were less than eight million combined. So I found that curious. So I asked some friends of mine in other countries who I met through the show here to let me know what they saw in their trending YouTube feeds. I had folks in Canada, Australia, England, and France tell me that the Gambino video was in the top two of each of their feeds. The top two in four other countries, but was not to be found in the top ten of my trending feed here in America. Okay, so maybe that's a fluke. After all, YouTube does not like me or my content. They've already deleted my channel once. So I asked three of my friends here in the States if they saw the video in their trending feeds, and they all reported back with a no. Now that was Sunday, and it hadn't changed Monday, but it did seem to change this morning, Tuesday. I guess Google can't suppress it for so long without it being a bit too obvious. But it's also blowing up. It's at 42 million views as I record this right now. So what does this tell us about actual America? What is the nature of this America that's not being mumble-wrapped about by establishment-approved musicians? And I was wrestling with that question, and, you know, after seeing that it was being, you know, suppressed in some way in the trending section here in the States. So I went to Twitter and Instagram to help answer these questions and posted a poll in both places asking what people thought of this video. And I got some pretty decent responses, actually. Uh, but the two options I gave the people were, was the video showcasing real America, or was it just more media propaganda? And the results were pretty close, but after tallying up everything, 56% of respondents thought it was propaganda and 44 thought it was America. I actually had one person on Twitter say I should have included an option that said both. And he was right. It really is both. It's American propaganda. And that's why I recorded this, because I have to ask if this really is America. And I do think it is a version of it, but I think it's the version of it that's broadcast through media such as this and through entertainment such as this. And the agenda of those entities has long been focused on some sort of gun control or even confiscation if you want to get really conspiratorial about it. They also love to create division among the population, whether it's through race or gender or political parties or sexual orientation. And these are always social issues that get politicized. And the fact that they're politicized and and emphasized so much in media should clue us into the fact that there are, you know, like the Gambino video here actually says, there are things going on in the background. I don't think this was made to be some sort of meta video that's commenting on itself, as it could be, and I can make a case for it, because there's more going on in the background than what this video even hints at or suggests. And here's where you can look at things like poisoned water in Flint, and fluoridated water everywhere, or genetically modified foods, or suppressed disease cures, or the rise of certain diseases and where they may come from, or the rampant geoengineered climate change and the Franken-skies, and the endless war on, well, everyone, which I don't think is restricted to a specific group of people. We're all struggling and fighting to stay alive here. We're all just barcodes and account numbers. We're all viewed as just consumers who use shit and then get rid of it and use more shit in its place. My apologies for the train in the background, by the way, but I think it adds a little ambiance to it. 
you know, what I'm trying to say is, I, I know this video was geared towards black America, but the message needs to be analyzed from every American's point of view because it's pertinent and it could also be divisive if we allow it to be. Now, one more interpretation of this that I want to share, this one from one of the many Reddit threads that were created about this video uh, from Reddit user, Reddit is pretty rad. And he or she calls the video the Society of the Spectacle in Music Video Form. And that piqued my interest because I'd heard that term, Society of the Spectacle, before, but wasn't sure exactly what it meant, so I looked it up. And because I'm sort of lazy, I'm just going to read what this is straight from the wiki entry. The Society of the Spectacle is a 1967 work of philosophy and Marxist critical theory by Guy Debord, in which the author develops and presents the concept of the spectacle. The book is considered a seminal text for the Situationist movement. And if we click over to that real quick and read about the Situationist movement, the Situationist International was an international organization of social revolutionaries made up of avant-garde artists, intellectuals, and political theorists it was prominent in Europe from its formation in 1957 to its dissolution in 1972. So that's interesting. A group of social revolutionaries made up of avant-garde artists, intellectuals, and political theorists. You know, I could see that. I could see Donald Glover being a part of that kind of group. He is sort of avant-garde with his art. Uh, but back to the Society of the Spectacle. The work is a series of 221 short theses in the form of aphorisms. Each thesis contains one paragraph. And then here's, here's the summary of what this is actually about now. The first theme in it is the degradation of human life. The board, the author, traces the development of a modern society in which authentic social life has been replaced with its representation. All that once was directly lived has become mere representation. That's a quote. Debord argues that the history of social life can be understood as, quote, the decline of being into having and having into merely appearing, end quote. This condition, according to Debord, is the historical moment at which the commodity completes its colonization of social life. The spectacle is the inverted image of society in which relations between commodities have supplanted relations between people, in which passive identification with the spectacle supplants genuine activity. The spectacle is not a collection of images, DeBoard writes. Rather, it is a social relation among people mediated by images. In his analysis of the spectacular society, DeBoard notes that the quality of life is impoverished with such a lack of authenticity that human perceptions are affected and an attendant degradation of knowledge, which in turn hinders critical thought. DeBoard analyzes the use of knowledge to assuage reality. The spectacle obfuscates the past, imploding it with the future into an undifferentiated mass, a type of never-ending present. In this way, the spectacle prevents individuals from realizing that the society of the spectacle is only a moment in history, one that can be overturned through revolution. Debord's aim and proposal is to wake up the spectator, who has been drugged by spectacular images, through radical action in the form of the construction of situations, situations that bring a revolutionary reordering of life, politics, and art. In the situationist view, situations are actively created moments characterized by a sense of self-consciousness of existence within a particular environment or ambiance. The board encouraged the use of, and I'm not sure what this word is, detournement, detournement, that looks French. Uh, regardless, the word involves using spectacular images and language to disrupt the flow of the spectacle. The second theme here, and there's just two more here that I'm going to share, so I won't be too much longer. Sorry if this is boring. But the second theme here is mass media and commodity fetishism. The society of the spectacle is a critique of contemporary consumer culture and commodity fetishism, dealing with issues such as class alienation, cultural homogenization, and mass media. When the board says that all that was once directly lived has become mere representation, he is referring to the central importance of the image in contemporary society. Images, the board says, have supplanted genuine human interaction. Thus, the board's fourth thesis is the spectacle is not a collection of images, rather it is a social relationship between people that is mediated by images. I think we already said that. Now whatever. In a consumer society, life is not about living but about having, and the spectacle uses the image to convey what people need and must have. Consequently, social life moves further, leaving a state of having and proceeding to a state of appearing, namely the appearance of an image. I think we're, this is just repeating the same stuff, sorry. But okay, and then in a world which really is topsy-turvy, the true is a moment of the false. An interesting statement there. Uh, the next theme, comparison between religion and marketing. 
The board also draws an equivalence between the role of mass media marketing in the present and the role of religions in the past. The spread of commodity images by the mass media produces waves of enthusiasm by a given product, resulting in moments of fervent exaltation similar to the ecstasies of the convulsions and miracles of the old religious fetishism. The board contends further that the remains of religion and of the family, which is the principal relic of the heritage of class power, uh, and the moral repression they assure, they merge whenever the enjoyment of this world is affirmed, this world being nothing other than repressive pseudo-enjoyment. The monotheistic religions were a compromise between myth and history. These religions arose on the soil of history and established themselves there, but there they still preserve themselves in radical opposition to history. The board defines them as semi-historical religion. Quote, the growth of knowledge about society, which includes the understanding of history as the heart of culture, derives from itself an irreversible knowledge, which is expressed by the destruction of God. Okay, so those are the themes I wanted to share with you. Again, I apologize for just reading those from Wikipedia. But I thought that was an interesting angle, uh, suggesting that this was the society of the spectacle. I think that makes a lot of sense. Now, regardless of the interpretation of the video, this is, at the least, you know, what art is meant to be or supposed to be. You won't find this in those Carrie Underwood or Nicki Minaj songs, and you won't find it in any Lil Uzi or Lil Xan mumble rap bullshit. And even if this is propaganda on some level, and it is, all media and entertainment is, but even so, this is the vehicle in which we should challenge and question and think critically. And if the response to this on Twitter and Instagram and Reddit and 4chan is any indication, people are at the very least doing just that. The dialogue around this piece of art is open and has been since it came online. And whether you enjoy the art or not is irrelevant. That's not the point of it. Part of the reason we're where we are now is because too many people have sought out art for enjoyment, have sought out a lot of things for enjoyment, instead of seeking out art that challenges their way of thinking and, and ultimately their way of being. And art should make you uncomfortable, and this is an uncomfortable piece of art because it cuts deep to some truths. And that's great, but again, a word of caution, don't get caught up on the surface of this video. Don't get caught up on the background of this video. I mean, it does look like an indictment of how far America has fallen both socially and culturally, and it is focused particularly on the degradation of African American culture. And that degradation seems to be very real and very much part of the worn out fabric of America and also part of whatever social engineering has been taking place in this country. And there definitely has been some, and you may have just watched four minutes of it with me. But hey, whatever happens, let's keep talking. Let's keep the dialogue open here. And let's be civil about it with each other. You know, healthy, constructive, and critical conversations are a must as we continue down whatever path we're really on here together. So let's stick by one another regardless of race or gender or orientation or belief of any sort. Let's keep loving, keep thinking, and keep questioning.